Welcome back and now for the news in detail. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he is monitoring the worsening situation in Indian occupied Kashmir. New Delhi's crushing curfew and communication blackout in the occupied valley has now entered 24th day. The UN Chief's spokesman Stefan Dujeric says the organization is especially concerned over the tightening restrictions and mass arrests in the occupied Kashmir. Earlier, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan said Islamabad would go to any extent to support the Kashmir cause. He was talking to the Chinese Central Military Commission Vice Chairman General Xu Chilyang, who called on him in Islamabad. Prime Minister Imran Khan warned that India may stage a false flag operation to divert the world's attention from occupied Kashmir. The Pakistan army says unprovoked fighting by Indian forces martyred two civilians in the Kroon sector along the line of control. 45-year-old Abdul Jalil and three-year-old girl Noshin were martyred. The Pakistan army says three other people were wounded in the fighting deliberately targeting the civilian population. Three houses were also burned in Indian army's aggression. The injured were shifted to hospital. On the other hand, India's Supreme Court has issued a notice to Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government. The court has taken up the petitions against India's revoking of occupied Kashmir's special status. Kashmiri activists and politicians have mounted the challenge to India's illegal move. Chief Justice Ranjan Gagoi issued the notice despite the opposition of the government lawyers. He said the court's order will not be changed. The case has been adjourned till early October. A five-member constitutional bench of the top court will hear the petition. Fierce fighting for the control of a strategic town in northwest Syria has claimed 60 lives. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights says 29 government soldiers and 31 rebels have been killed. The monitor says heavy casualties came during a rebel counter-offensive to retake government-held positions in Idli province. Some analysts say the government's seizure of the town is part of a campaign to take control of highway linking Damascus to Aleppo. Russia says rebels have attacked 19 of its so-called reconciliation centers in Aleppo, Latakia and Idlib. Earlier, Russian and Syrian government airstrikes killed 12 civilians in Idlib. At least five migrants have died and 20 are missing after a shipwreck off the Libyan coast. The vessel was carrying up to 90 people. Libyan Coast Guard spokesperson Ayub Qasim says the bodies of five migrants were recovered. He says over 65 people were rescued nine miles off the coast of the city of Homs. Three of the dead were from Morocco, one from Sudan and one from Somalia. The UNHCR says most survivors were from Sudan with others from Egypt, Morocco and Tunisia. Libya has long been a major transit route for migrants, especially from sub-Saharan Africa. Yemen's Houthi rebels have destroyed tons of food aid held up for months in the war-torn country. UN says the aid had been intended for the families in the city of Thais in November 2018. For details, watch this report. Yemen was already the Arabian Peninsula's poorest country when a Saudi-led coalition intervened in 2015 to prop up the government. Conflict has triggered malnutrition, and the UN calls it the world's worst humanitarian crisis. The WFP says it feeds around 11 million people a month in Yemen. Food distribution to Houthi-controlled territories in June were stopped after food meant for Yemeni civilians was diverted. Food program spokesperson says they need unimpeded access to all areas of the country to provide food to those who need it most. We warned the organizations, the international organizations, to take their responsibilities. Otherwise, we will deter those who might be tempted to do this again. Providing expired food to the Yemeni people, we will never allow this. The UN says it was desperate for funds in Yemen when a shortage of cash forced it to temporarily stop its aid programs.
Lebanon has stressed its right to defend itself after two Israeli drones violated its airspace. President Michel Aoun denounced the act as a declaration of war. Lebanon's High Defense Council says the country has the right to defend itself against any aggression. Prime Minister Saad Hariri says the attack poses a threat to regional stability. He says Israel used the attack to change the rules of engagement. The violation of Lebanese airspace came after Israel launched strikes in neighboring Syria. Three Palestinian police officers have been killed in explosions at two checkpoints in Gaza Strip. Several others have been injured. The attacks followed a recent Hamas operation against ISIS-linked militants. Interior Ministry spokesperson Ayad al buzom says a state of emergency has been declared throughout Gaza. He says security forces have made progress in finding the suspects but disclosed no further details. Eyewitnesses told reporters the explosions occurred within an hour of each other. UNRWA for Palestine refugees needs $150 million to keep operating until the end of this year. Agency's Commissioner General Pierre Cranbull says it needs donations because Switzerland and the Netherlands and Belgium have suspended contributions. UNRWA provides services to 5 million Palestinian refugees in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, the West Bank and Gaza. Last year, the organization's biggest donor, the United States, stopped its aid of $360 million a year. Cranbull says the agency has launched an investigation over allegations of corruption and misconduct at this office. U.S. President Donald Trump says there is no fixed timeline for the withdrawal of the U.S. forces from Afghanistan. Talking to media in France, the U.S. President said forces are in no rush to pull out. Trump restated he can end the war in a short time but doesn't want mass casualties. Talking of the peace process, he said Washington is working with the Taliban government and other parties. The ninth round of talks between Washington and Taliban is underway in Doha. Japan is evacuating a quarter of a million people from southern Kyosho in the wake of heavy rains. The country's meteorological agency has issued its highest emergency warning, citing extreme weather. The agency says there is a risk of landslides and flooding because of its downpours. It says parts of the northern island are experiencing more torrential rain. Japan's state media says two men have died in rain-related accidents in Saga Prefecture and Fukuoka. These areas were hit with more than 100 millimeters of rainfall in an hour. Japan has dropped South Korea from its list of preferred trading partners. This intensifies a diplomatic spat between the key U.S. allies. Seoul has been dropped from the list over a wartime forced labor dispute. Japanese manufacturers must now seek approval for each technology-related export contract for Seoul. Seoul's previous status as a preferential trade partner meant simpler checks on exports. South Korea's foreign ministry has summoned Japanese envoy Yasumasa Nagamine to lodge a complaint. Prime Minister Lee Nakyon says he will take the matter to the World Trade Organization. South Korea has also ended a military intelligence sharing pact with Japan. Moving on to Peru, where the archaeologists have unearthed the remains of 227 children. The sacrificial site was used by the pre-Columbian Chimu culture. The remains were unveiled after a year of digging in Juan Chaco, a beachside tourist town in Lima. Chief archaeologist Ferran Castillo says the children, aged between 4 and 14, were sacrificed to honor the Chimu god. Chimu culture thrived between 1200 and 1400 CE. Archaeologists first found children's remains at a site in the town's Pampa La Cruz neighborhood. 56 skeletons were unearthed in June 2018.
Brazil is ready to accept $22 million in aid from G7 countries to fight fires in Amazon. President Jair Bolsonaro had already rejected the offer, demanding the French president apologize for calling him a liar. Bolsonaro's spokesperson, Rigo Berro, says aid will only be accepted if Brazil controls the way it is spent. In Porto Velo, scores of people are seeking treatment for respiratory problems caused by smoke. Medics say children are worst affected by intensifying smog from the rainforest fires. Meanwhile, Peru and Colombia have called for an emergency meeting of Amazonian nations next month. U.S. President Donald Trump has approved an emergency declaration for Puerto Rico ahead of Tropical Storm Dorian. Trump instructed federal agencies to handle all of the island's disaster relief efforts. Storm Dorian caused power blackouts, uprooted trees and ripped off roofs in Barbados and St. Lucia. The storm is expected to become a hurricane after it moves across Puerto Rico later today. It's on track to hit the Bahamas and Florida. The U.S. Federal Management Agency says nearly 3,000 federal employees have been stationed to offer assistance. Italy's populist and centre-left leaders are walking a tightrope as the deadline to form a new government ends today. President Sergio Mattarella would call fresh elections at the end of the day. Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte resigned after League Party chief Matteo Salvini withdrew from the ruling alliance. Attempts to reunite the coalition have since failed. Negotiations on forming a new coalition were boosted yesterday. The Democratic Party has appeared to back Conte's reinstatement. U.S. President Donald Trump waded into the crisis, backing Conte's apparent reinstatement. European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker says a no-deal Brexit will be the UK's decision and not the EU's. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the Irish backstop must be abolished for a deal. Speaking to Prime Minister Johnson, Juncker said the European Commission will do everything to stop a no-deal Brexit. He said the remaining 27 EU members' support for the Republic of Ireland is steadfast. Prime Minister Johnson told Juncker there is no prospect of a Brexit deal unless the Irish backstop is removed. The EU has insisted any Brexit deal must contain the backstop. The border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland is a key part of Brexit negotiations. It's so time for a short break, but coming up next in the bulletin. Inflow of tourists to occupied valley drops. Airbus and Boeing will have to compete with a new player. Welcome back. The inflow of tourists to Indian-occupied Kashmir has drastically declined as the lockdown in the valley has crossed over 20 days. This has distressed locals, many of whom rely on tourism for their livelihoods. More in this report. With its breathtaking scenery, snow-capped mountains and placid lakes, Indian-occupied Kashmir is a popular destination for tourists. But on August 5th, India illegally revoked its special status as a disputed territory. Since then, New Delhi has shut down communications and clamped down on freedom of movement in the occupied valley. This has gone on to hit the tourism industry hard, which employs some 100,000 people. 90% is tourism, uh, dependent on tourism. So they know they are dependent on tourism, that's true like this. And they have trappers. Even in Eid, we couldn't buy anything. We couldn't buy any uh, vegetable, we couldn't buy any food for our family, we couldn't celebrate. According to official data, more than half a million people visited the valley in the first seven months of this year. 
Since New Delhi scrapped the occupied valley's autonomy, just 150 foreign travellers have visited Kashmir. We hope to see many travellers and tourists in here and we can talk to each other, but we cannot see everything. Uh, I think uh, it is really inconvenient and, uh, for local people and uh, actually some people privately express that they are very unhappy about this. It's what I thought. The valley has faced major disruptions in 2008 and 2010, and recently in 2016, when large protests broke out. But this time the residents say there is no end to the current crisis in sight, and they fear the situation will get worse and cause massive unrest. Ethiopia produces heart, a shrub whose leaves are due to obtain a stimulating effect. Though popular among the youth, Doctors believe it is a gateway drug to harder substances. This report will tell you how this addiction is dangerous. These men are all in rehab because of cat. The plant is known for its stimulating effect and chewing it is common in Ethiopia, but its consumption can lead to other addictions. I've been in addiction like for the past 15 years for, um, but with a lot of addiction, addictive substances like charts, like cigarettes, like um, marijuana. At this state-run rehab center, services are free and patients are encouraged to give up the leafy stimulant, a rare approach in a region where few try to tackle the controversial habit. While banned in many countries, in Ethiopia, chewing cat is legal and widely seen as a cultural activity. Users sometimes turn to other drugs to dull the plant's amphetamine-like effects. The whole night they can read. Most of them, uh, they start uh, ch uh, chewing chat for reading for increasing capacity of work, for increasing the performance in study in different works. In this district of the capital, excitement peaks when a truck full of cat finally arrives. Many chew it on the street and refuse to believe these leaves can lead to other addictions. That's not true. The people who say that were already addicted to alcohol and other drugs before they started using cat. Often referred to as green gold, cat is Ethiopia's second biggest export behind coffee and its domestic consumption is growing. Campaigns by local civil society groups have failed to result in a ban. A Chinese-made jetliner completed it, uh, its first test flight at Beijing Daxing International Airport earlier this week. This means heavyweights of industry like Airbus and Boeing will have to compete with a new player. More in this report. From cell phones to 5G infrastructure, China has made inroads into key global industries. And now China is trying to make its mark in the Boeing industry. I feel very proud as a pilot flying a passenger jet manufactured independently by China and landing at the Daxing airport. The Chinese-made passenger jet left the city of Chengdu, landing at Beijing's Daxing airport two hours later. After the landing, the ARJ-21 completed a series of test exercises. We fly to Daxing Airport as part of second stage flight tests of the newly built airport. We mainly undertake tests including simulated low visibility flight, desync drill, airport catering and sewage disposal, among others. The ARJ-21 flies at an altitude of nearly 12,000 meters and can reach speeds of up to 827 kilometers an hour. The aircraft will later fly back to Chengdu as part of its next phase of testing. Tea presented by kimono-clad geishas has long been an integral part of Japanese culture. With the tea ceremony, the trend has now come knocking foreign doors as matcha tea exports increase. For a flavor of the trend, watch this report. The unique flavors of Japan's matcha tea are loved by people from every part of the world. In recent years, where Japan's own tea consumption has declined, a rise in exports has saved the tea-producing community. In order to match international standards, matcha is now being added to desserts and drinks. It is important to imagine new ways of presenting tea to allow people to rediscover its value. 
In Japan, the consumption of green tea leaves for drinking dropped from 1,174 grams per household in 2001 to 844 grams in 2015. Seeing an opening in the market, Suzuki branched into matcha-flavored ice cream nine years ago. It opened a shop where customers can choose gelato flavors. Tea growers are also jumping on the bandwagon to grow matcha leaves because they command a higher price than sencha. Bread and noodles have gained some ground in eating habits that have relatively reduced the consumption of rice and tea. Unlike in the past, there are fewer Japanese people who drink tea all the time. And instead, more and more Japanese people are enjoying a variety of food. And so the sales of tea are going down. Manufacturers are finding innovative ways of making tea more appealing to foreign palettes. With growing global tea competition and finding the right blend of culture and innovation, the fight to support matcha farmers goes on. Lows in the highs of the business world, now Asian stocks are unsteady over lingering doubts of resumption of trade talks between China and the U.S. China's foreign ministry had dismissed claims made by the U.S. President Donald Trump. The Shanghai Composite is trading down a fraction, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng is flat. In Tokyo, the Nikkei 225 index is marginally higher. Investors on both the sides of the Pacific are cautious because long-term U.S. bond yields have dipped further. Many economists see the inverted yield curve as evidence that U.S. economy is headed into recession. All Wall Street indices closed down a fraction overnight, but Seoul's Kospi has gained nearly 1%. And now the weather situation from around the globe. That's all for now. For other updates, stay tuned to Indus News.